Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And, and blessed be God's kingdom, kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Grant, O merciful God, that your church, being gathered together in unity by your Holy Spirit, may show forth your power among all peoples to the glory of your name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Exodus. Now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, Look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, or they'll increase, and in the event of war, join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore they set taskmasters over them to oppress them with forced labor. They built supply cities, Pithom and Ramesses, for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread, so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. The Egyptians became ruthless in imposing tasks on the Israelites and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in every kind of field labor. They were ruthless in all the tasks that they imposed on them. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Pua, when you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a boy, kill him, but if it is a girl, she shall live. But the midwives feared God. They did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every boy that is born to the Hebrews you shall throw into the Nile, but you shall let every girl live. Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine baby, she hid him three months. When she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and plastered it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds on the bank of the river. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her attendants walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid to bring it. When she opened it, she saw the child. He was crying and she took pity on him. This must be one of the Hebrews' children, she said. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Yes. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child and nurse it for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed it. When the child grew up, 
she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and she took him as her son. She named him Moses, because she said, I drew him out of the water. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. in heaven. 
And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise you, Lord, Lord Christ. Christ. chapter in Matthew's Gospel, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Well, that's quite a revelation. Let's put that revelation in context. The situation is that Jesus has been healing and teaching and feeding. He has gone on the mountaintop and communed with his Heavenly Father had the extraordinary events on the lake, and he has finally taken a little journey out of town. Parenthetically, in this COVID era, how blessed it is to take a few moments to be able to take a journey out of town carefully and within the rules. His exhaustion was different from ours, but it's exhaustion just the same. Anyway, he has left the usual haunts and has gone to a place called Caesarea Philippi, which is not in the center of the life of the Hebrew peoples. It's an adjacent area. He's kind of gone out of town with his disciples. And they're having a conversation, apparently. And Jesus asks his disciples, who are no doubt mulling over all they have seen and heard and trying to figure it out, he first asks them, who do the people say the Son of Man is? That is to say, what do others think about me? What are they telling you that they're not telling me? I'm not sure what they really thought about that question, but they did what I would do, I guess, if you're asked such a question, which is you tend to look backward, that is to say, you tend to look for heroes that come from then, that fit in. So some thought that this Son of Man, this Jesus, might be Elijah the prophet. You remember Elijah who arrives heroically to save the people and then essentially goes back up into heaven, passing the job on to Elisha, which has led to countless readings of lessons in the Old Covenant scriptures in which people say Elisha when they mean Elijah and Elijah when they mean Elisha. But that's us. That's the story. They know the story. Elijah, the prophet who'll come home one day. Maybe that's Jesus. Good guess. Some say, well, he's one of the prophets. He's a new prophet. He's a Jeremiah or an Isaiah, or a Hosea, or an Amos. One of those who speaks in God's name so powerfully that it's more than we've ever experienced and we listen. Not bad, not bad. Jesus certainly witnesses to God. The bold ones suggest John the Baptist. Do you remember John the Baptist story, beheaded? Maybe John the Baptist has come back to life in the form of Jesus, and those who followed John the Baptist maybe could follow Jesus and it all fits together. That's the most creative one. It's the most recent event, and it's kind of the neatest one to gather the story together. You know, if anybody ever asks us what other people think, 
You know how easy it is to say that? Well, I think other people think such and so about you or this or that or the other. And if Jesus had left the conversation at the who do the people say I am, we wouldn't be paying any attention really. But of course, the conversation shifts. Jesus says to them, and who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? I imagine there was a very long silence. In the scripture, it doesn't look like it. Peter leaps forward with an answer, but I don't think so. I think there was a long, uncomfortable pause. Would you want to answer that question? Would you feel comfortable? adequately informed, honest enough to yourself to answer that question. Simon says, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Pardon me for assuming everybody else was slightly aghast. I mean, let's face it, Simon is Somebody who played out of his gut. Sometimes his gut's pretty good, and sometimes his gut is absolutely awful. He just blows it out there and you hope for the best. I mean, he was a big guy apparently, he was a fisherman, he was apparently pretty strong based on some of the tasks he is described doing. He was a natural leader at some level, but he was also completely blind to so much, so often so often unable to live up to who he wished he should be. In other words, a lot like us. Well, he bursts out with, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. This is a deep theological proclamation. We've been hearing it for 2,000 years, so we forget, but this is a big thing. Jesus says to him, Simon, you have been given this news, not from your own wisdom, but from the Heavenly Father. And I'm going to give you a new name. I'm going to call you Cephas, which translates into rock, or Peter. And now you're the rock on which I will build my church. And they had no idea what the church was. We do. They didn't. Whenever somebody gets a new name in the Bible, it's a big moment. So that's the story. And it's self-evident. It's a proclamation story. It's God sharing with the disciples and no one else who Jesus is, even though they can't really figure it out. It's a nice story of back then. But I'd like to suggest that the church that it creates is not because of Peter, but rather because of Peter's faith. Some argue that if the church is created as Peter as the head and all that follows from that, but I'm not so sure. I think it's the faithfulness to not inhibit what God's telling him to say and letting the chips fall where they may. That's something upon which to build the church, but it leads to the tougher questions. Namely, nowadays, in our lives, in our culture, in our time, who do you say Jesus is? Son of God, okay. Yeah. But what does that mean when we live in relationship to God and in the family, the community of the church? Think about it. Who do you say, really, 
In your heart of hearts, Jesus is. Some of the great mystics have said all sorts of different things beyond the sort of immediate proclamation of Son of God. Some have seen in Jesus the greatest teacher, one who's teaching with so much authority that you can always find what Jesus teaches a well in which you can deeply dip again and again and again and find fresh wisdom. I think Jesus is a teacher, in part. Some people in mystic experiences in particular talk about Jesus as a healer, it's the most powerful element they've experienced of who Jesus is in their lives. Not only healing in the limited sense of physical recovery from disease, but healing in the sense of taking fractured bits and pieces and making them whole. Making us whole in a way that we cannot possibly do left to our own devices. Jesus is certainly a healer. You may have other things and other ways in which the implication of who Jesus is lives in your lives. And I hope that you'll take the time to reflect on them in the light of this particular gospel. But if I stop here, I've chickened out, haven't I? Because I haven't told you who I thought, who I think Jesus is for me. I think Jesus, God's Messiah, the Christ, is my partner. My partner in a journey. A journey which has in it times that I'm kind of on the path and feel like it. And I can feel that my partner's joy is there as I'm in the path. But I can also look back and see all the ways in which I wander way away from that path. But my partner, mystically speaking, for reasons I do not fully understand, chooses not to abandon me chooses not to say, well, you made your own bed, so lie in it. Could. Some might argue should. But this partner never gives up on my journey. Never. That makes the word patience extraordinarily inadequate. And yet, this partner in my journey is patient indeed. So patient that even the best friend I've ever had in life's patience could not be equal to it. And I've been blessed with good friends who are very patient. Well, that isn't Jesus just for me. I think in so many manifestations, in so many ways, Jesus is your partner in this journey too. However you define it, however it affects your life, for however long it's affected your life and for however long it will to come, you have a patient, oh so patient, partner in your spiritual journey too. Who do we say Jesus is? He's the Messiah, the Son of the God who is always living, always seeking us, always drawing us closer if only we will. 
the most patient friend and partner we will ever know. St. Michael's Church, Milton, 
Grace Church, Norwood, St. John's Church, Sharon. We pray for those on our parish prayer list, Dave, Gary, Nathan, Ryan, Shirley, Raymond, Tana, Candace, Kayla, Christine, Lorraine, Joyce, Louise, George, Ruth, Neil, Douglas and Babs, Marissa, Suzanne, John and Marilyn, Fran and Robert, Fran and Esther, Sue, Robin, Camille, David, Wayne, Rodolfo, Stephanie, Otto, Lisa, Paul, and Mark. We give thanks for those celebrating birthdays this week, especially Christine Judge. We give thanks for those celebrating anniversaries this week, especially Max and John King. We pray for all those impacted in body, mind, or state by COVID-19 and this economic and public health emergency. We pray for all those who have died. We pray for the continued growth of this parish in mission, numbers, and impact for the building up of God's kingdom. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others, either silently or aloud. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, Peace I give to you, my own peace I leave with you. Regard not our sins with the faith of your church, and give to us the peace and unity of that heavenly city, where with the Father and the Holy Spirit you live and reign, now and forever. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. The worship continues now with a celebration of the Holy Eucharist. As we are not able to be gathered in person yet, um, the receiving of the communion becomes a truly spiritual experience, and there is a prayer that you are familiar with if you've been seeing our tapings, that is a prayer of spiritual communion, and it's in the bulletin if you downloaded that as well. Um, so I invite us to join in saying those words when we would otherwise be physically receiving the sacrament at the appropriate time. The Lord be with you. And also, and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them, them to the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. 
For you are the source of light and life. You made us in your own image and called us to new life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself, in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. When he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O oh Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension. We offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit, to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask for your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not unto temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia! Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us, Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Grant us your peace. Inviting you to say together, my Jesus, I believe that you are truly present in the blessed sacrament of the altar. I love you above all things and long for you in my soul. 
Since I cannot now receive you sacramentally, come spiritually into my heart. As though you have already come, I embrace you and unite myself entirely to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord, to him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be our and glory, now and forever. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you and those you love on earth and in paradise this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Let us go forth into the world in peace. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia. alleluia. alleluia.